It's busy as ever here in Starbase with the return of a full stack to the pad for testing ahead of Starship Flight 4. Plus, we got some interesting information from the FAA themselves about the mishap investigation from Flight 3. Tower sections have finally begun to migrate from the Port of Brownsville to the Sanchez lot. The footprint of the Star Factory is nearly complete and we did a flyover, so we get to examine all of this in detail from the air. Howdy, Tank Watchers. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start our recap of what was an exciting week at Massey's with Ship 26 still on the static fire stand perched over the new flame trench. Ship 26 still hasn't done any kind of cryo testing here, but it remains to be seen what SpaceX's plans are. Will Ship 26 do a cryo and maybe even a static fire on this new stand? We'll just have to wait and see. This new stand is pretty cool because all SpaceX has to do is drive two SPMTs underneath it and move it into the high bay if they want to put a ship on or take one off. It's a simple system that allows them to not have to have a crane out at Massey's for lifting ships, like SpaceX used to have to do at the suborbital pads. In order to get the stand over the trench, SpaceX has built a ramp that goes up to the correct level. Then it has a work platform that can go over the hole that goes down and into the trench. Right next to Ship 26, we can see the new methane tank farm as part of the new test stand. Here we can see a pair of subcoolers connected to the same type of pumps SpaceX uses in the orbital tank farm. These are hooked into a pair of main supply tanks with the tank pressurization system nearby in the form of these vaporizers. Right next to the methane tank farm is the deluge farm, which holds all of the water needed for the flame bucket and deluge system for the new static fire stand. This has three large water storage tanks and a couple of high pressure tanks that push water into the bucket and spray it out of tiny holes, which hopefully will help protect the bucket from erosion when it's hit by Raptor engine exhaust. Now let's look toward the entrance of Massey's where we can see SpaceX continuing to work on a massive new structural test stand. There are several curved pieces seen here that show this stand is set to have around three full levels to it, which will make it taller than the nose cone cage next door. Based on the design of some of these pieces, SpaceX should be able to use this stand to twist, crush, turn, or bend a test tank any which way they want, which will ideally give them more ability to test designs before they make their way into a full vehicle and eventually fly. And of course, while we're at Massey's, we have to talk about Ship 31, which some of you have taken to calling Sparky for an admittedly good reason. As we mentioned last week, Ship 31 suffered an anomaly while conducting a cryogenic proof test at Massey's. After seeing close-up shots, it looks like a COPV line that is routed down the raceway had a failure, which resulted in that line bursting. It seems that the event caused electrical lines to be cut and frayed, which led to a short and arcing, which ultimately led to the electrical fire as seen on our cameras. These lines come from the composite overwrap pressure vessels, or COPVs, in the tip of the nose cone and are routed down the raceway into the engine bay. These COPVs hold a variety of commodities that are useful on the ship, including nitrogen, helium, and carbon dioxide. In a twist of fate, these high pressure lines most likely put out the fire shortly after it started, which is good news for SpaceX as it hopefully limited some of the damage. However, all of that arcing may have damaged some or all of the electrical components on Ship 31. So we'll just have to wait and see what the future has in store for old Sparky. Arky? I like Arky. Following the anomaly, Ship 31 was rolled back to the high bay for inspections and repairs. It could take some time for this ship to be back in working order before SpaceX performs another cryogenic proof test with it. In terms of what this could mean for other ships, well, SpaceX only has three other ships with the same general design. That's Ship 26, Ship 29, and Ship 30. There's also, of course, Ship 32, but it still doesn't have its raceway yet, so I'm not including it here. We know that as a result of the anomaly, SpaceX paused operations at the orbital launch site and delayed stacking Ship 29 atop Booster 11. It then did some inspections of Ship 29's raceway, which was probably related to the anomaly. Going forward, SpaceX will perform their own investigation into the problem and identify solutions. We might even see the COPV lines move away from the raceway in the future. Staying at the production site for a moment, we saw Booster 14 moved off of the left turntable and onto the right work stand, where SpaceX will work to complete the vehicle 
before sending it to Massey's for a cryogenic proof test. As a reminder, Booster 14 is currently slated for Starship Flight 7, and its pair, Ship 32, is still in the rocket garden, again, without a raceway. But that's far from the most exciting news we got regarding hardware in the Mega Bay this week. We got a huge surprise. Can you guess what it is? That's right, a new test tank. The Burgenator's favorite. And mine too. Come on, who doesn't like a good test tank? I just love these wonky little guys. Seeing SpaceX test them to failure is quite a treat and reminds me of the good old days in Starbase when there was a lot less walls and a lot more explosions. We saw SpaceX roll the B14.1 forward section, the B14.1 common dome, and a methane tank quad, that's a four ring barrel, into Mega Bay 1 for stacking. I just barely caught the 14.1 forward section rolling down Highway 4, and let me tell you, being that close to hardware never gets old. This will be the first true test tank capable of holding cryogenic fluids since the E-Dome 2 test tank in September of last year. It's unclear what SpaceX intends to test with this tank, but fingers crossed we might get to see it pop. The B14.1 test tank may also be the first to use the new structural test stand at Massey's we were talking about earlier, so you better believe we're going to keep our eyes on it. As seen from both our aerial and terrestrial images, the parking garage is coming along rapidly, and both ends of the structure are now at their full height, which is six levels. As stated before, this will clean up all of the parking seen along Highway 4 here. It's really cool seeing how quickly buildings like this can go up using prefabricated concrete sections. I can't help but imagine there being some sort of parking garage catalog where architects can order a rectangle 3B or a, I don't know, some kind of weird Ikea named parking garage. Like, yeah, I'll take a Strumpful. And it's, everyone knows a Strumpful is just like a six level parking garage for 600 cars or something. In addition to the parking garage, SpaceX is making some long overdue upgrades to the infrastructure at the production site. In several locations, SpaceX is installing lines that will go to Mega Bay 1, Mega Bay 2, the High Bay, and the Star Factory. These lines will supply commodities from a commodities farm located at the Sanchez lot. The commodities should include nitrogen, oxygen, and argon for welding and purging during the construction of starships and boosters. Currently, the bays and the factory have separate tanks for the commodities, as seen here, which are just high-pressure tanks parked outside of the bays. Trucks coming into Starbase have to periodically refill these tanks, and this upgrade will help SpaceX produce what is required on site without having to truck it all in. Note that this is different than the old air separation unit at the Sanchez lot, where SpaceX was going to produce propellants for Starships. This is only being used to produce gaseous commodities for use at the production site. They're not making locks or liquid nitrogen here. As we fully zoom out, we can see almost the final footprint of the Star Factory. This factory is massive and has a total floor space of around 1 million square feet. It's truly hard to fully comprehend the scale of just how big Star Factory is. Here, we can see the 40 or so air conditioning units that the Sky Crane lifted onto the roof of the building last week. With just a few units remaining to be placed, here's hoping that we get some more Sky Crane action in the near future, although my gut tells me that that was an extremely rare one-off event. I'm mostly mentioning it now so that Ryan has an excuse to put more Sky Crane footage in this video because I love the Sky Crane and so should you. If we take a look around the back of Star Factory, we can see a new forward flap design for Starship block or version or whatever you want to call it, the second type of Starship that SpaceX will build. The flap has a slightly different design from the current flaps and is significantly thinner which just goes to show the optimization SpaceX is constantly doing with Starship's design. Now, currently, there are a few footings left to finish for the Star Factory, like up here next to Mega Bay 2, where SpaceX looks to be integrating the Star Factory and the bay together to possibly allow for a seamless transfer of ring sections into the bay. Moving to the front of the factory, SpaceX appears to have finished the front glass section and all of the paneling in the front of the factory. Hopefully in the future we can look through all of this glass at night and see Starship nose cone sections being worked on. At least one can dream. Moving along to the office building, SpaceX has been steadily starting the north section of the building while adding in several new footings near the south section next to the Star Factory. These footings show SpaceX's plans to connect the Star Factory and the office building together. When this is all complete, someone will be able to walk from the office building through the Star Factory and all the way into Mega Bay 2 without ever stepping foot outside. It's truly astounding to see all of this massive infrastructure 
spring up out of nowhere, and it's honestly kind of mind-boggling the scale of it all. Speaking of Mega Bay 2, we can look inside it and see the three work stands that will help facilitate the construction and maintenance of ships. On the other side, in the front corner, is the only turntable in Mega Bay 2, which was recently tested with a triple barrel section and a single ring to verify the welding robot. Now let's head to the launch site and check in on suborbital pad B. And well, it's completely torn down, along with the berm that was behind it. As seen last week, SpaceX wasted no time in tearing the pad down once Ship 30 was off the stand. SpaceX has also begun to remove tanks from the suborbital tank farm, with a couple of horizontal tanks already having been removed, and some of the vertical ones as well. The hustle to clear out suborbital pad B makes a lot of sense, as SpaceX is preparing the pilings for the second launch tower at this location. Right around this large square area here looks to be the location of Starbase's second tower, based on the document from the FAA. This appears to be the approximate location using Google Maps and then comparing it to the flyover photos. So we know where the tower is going, but the big question then becomes, where will the second orbital launch mount go? Will it be to the east of the launch tower, like the current pad in Starbase and the pad in Kennedy Space Center? Or will SpaceX throw us a curveball and put the second orbital launch mount to the south of the second tower, maybe to protect the orbital tank farm too? that they're going to build in this area? Let us know what you think in the comments. Next door to this, on the other side of the newly built and very nice Gateway to Mars wall, which will probably have to be torn down, is a large staging area for all of the equipment that SpaceX is going to need to build an entirely new orbital launch pad. Speaking of the second tower, as of this recording, SpaceX has rolled sections seven and three to the Sanchez site. These will be staged here before eventually rolling to the launch site, maybe later this summer. SpaceX still has a road closure set up for tower section movement on May 20th from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Central Time, and they may add more as they did miss a closure earlier this week. Speaking of the Sanchez site, here, these tower sections will be fitted out with the final main cryogenic propellant lines and other equipment teams want to install before rolling them out and stacking them. As we can see here, SpaceX has several cryo lines sitting on the ground waiting to be installed onto the new tower sections. Now, if we look up at the rocket garden, we can see SpaceX has been slowly removing Booster 4's Raptors and cutting the nozzles off the power heads. The power head, of course, refers to the turbo pumps and valves on an engine. And if anyone has Elon's number, just let him know that you know a guy who would take some Raptor parts off his hands. Along with the tower sections and Booster 4's remains, there are several other interesting things to see here at the Sanchez lot. Here is the white booster cap that was used on Booster 13 when it rolled to Massey's for cryo-testing. SpaceX even has another one of these already built down near Highway 4. Over here, we can see SpaceX has a second new booster transport stand ready to go, should they need one in the future, along with a third that is only a ring right now. SpaceX doesn't appear to be in a hurry to finish this one, as it's just not needed. Last but not least, there's a turntable sitting next to the scrapyard. Originally, we thought this turntable would be used as a second turntable inside Mega Bay 2, so SpaceX could work on two ships at the same time. But we don't know why it hasn't been installed yet, or if it will ever be installed. We'll just have to wait and see, like so many of the things at Starbase. Now let's move here to the launch site, where SpaceX is continuing to remove and scrap the vertical tanks from the orbital tank farm. One of the liquid nitrogen tanks is already fully gone, and scrapping of the second has started. At this pace, all of the vertical tanks will be gone before you can say the best part is no part. It's unknown what, if anything, SpaceX will put in place of the scrapped vertical tanks, but we'll keep our eyes on that area for any developments. And now for the main event, Flight 4, which SpaceX actually made decent progress on this week, at least in terms of getting ready to fly. I mean, look, the full stack full stack, right? Early on in the week, SpaceX appears to have aborted the stack of Ship 29 and then rolled it away from the orbital launch mount. Again, this might have been in response to Ship 31's anomaly because, as stated earlier, teams were inspecting the raceway after it was rolled away. Once these inspections were done, teams rolled Ship 29 back to the chopsticks and the Flight 4 vehicles were stacked for the first time. This stack took a little while, but was incredibly smooth, with no loud bang as the ship came down after the final adjustment. In fact, we can see here the fine adjustment SpaceX can perform to line up these vehicles. On Thursday, a mini wet dress rehearsal of the Flight 4 stack was performed in an interesting load sequence. Compared to the last launch, the ship was loaded even earlier than the booster, 
and the booster methane tank was loaded a decent amount earlier than the booster liquid oxygen tank. This could have been a new loading method that we'll see employed on Starship Flight 4, or it could just be SpaceX trying out some different things for whatever test purposes. We don't know, but hopefully soon we'll find out. After that test, SpaceX opened the liquid oxygen hatch and possibly the engine bay access hatch as we can see hoses hooked up for ventilation. Anytime I see these white ventilation hoses hooked up to a booster, I can't help but remember the Booster 7 anomaly back in 2022. RIP white hose, never forget. With these hatches open, SpaceX is most likely performing final inspections and any last minute work needed before the full wet dress rehearsal. Side note that this might just be the first time that SpaceX has opened these hatches on a booster while a ship is stacked atop it. Once the work inside the booster's tanks is complete, SpaceX aims to conduct a full wet dress rehearsal with the full Starship stack. And as stated earlier, by the time you watch this video, it might already be underway or even completed. I say that because SpaceX has road closures for May 20th, 21st, and 22nd from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. A wet dress rehearsal is required, at least in part, because SpaceX has switched over to all of the horizontal tanks for the orbital tank farm which you can see here, four liquid nitrogen tanks and five liquid oxygen tanks, along with all of the lines that lead to the pumps and subcoolers. The full wet dress rehearsal should be the final test ahead of Flight 4, and once it's complete, SpaceX will destack Ship 29 and probably roll it back to the production site for final work on its heat shield inside of the high bay. To add even more intrigue to the Flight 4 preparation fun time, our very own Adrian Bile got a response from the FAA regarding Starship Flight 3's mishap investigation, and a request that SpaceX has made of the agency. The biggest part of the email is this quote from the FAA. Quote, if the FAA agrees no public safety issues were involved in the mishap, the operator, that's SpaceX, may return to flight while the mishap investigation remains open, provided all other license requirements are met." End quote. So this is pretty big news, and quite a development. SpaceX has requested the option for a launch license modification that does not require the mishap investigation to be closed. This would be a public safety determination by the FAA, in which the operator may request the FAA make a public safety determination based on information that the mishap did not involve safety-critical systems or otherwise jeopardize public safety. The FAA will review the request and, if in agreement, authorize a return to flight operation while the mishap investigation remains open and provided the operator meets all relevant licensing requirements. This means that SpaceX could fly Flight 4 without having to close the mishap investigation into Flight 3 first. Assuming, of course, that the mishap of Flight 3 didn't involve any safety critical systems or jeopardize public safety. SpaceX still has to meet all of the license requirements as stated by the Federal Aviation Regulations. A wet dress rehearsal may be required to get the vehicle signed off for another flight. Another requirement for Flight 4 is, of course, the FTS, or Flight Termination System. And this week, we had the added treat of seeing the explosives for Flight 4's FTS system delivered to the explosives bunker here at Starbase. I can't help but point out the amusing, at least to me, fact that SpaceX is using Pelican cases, the same sort of cases used in the TV and film industry to transport camera equipment, to transport high explosives. I mean, hey, I can't blame them. They're good cases, even if they are a little bit overpriced. But I digress. The delivery of these charges is a excellent sign for the coming of Flight 4. Based on Kathy Leader's comments at a recent small business owner event here in Brownsville, SpaceX is targeting Flight 4 for just after Memorial Day, which is May 27th. This lines up with Elon's comments last week in response to John Krauss that launch would be around three to five weeks away. SpaceX has a lot of work to do to make this timeline happen, but it is possible, although the FAA would have to grant their request. When do you think Flight 4 will happen? I'm going to go with early June, barring any sort of mishap that would delay things like another Ship 31 style anomaly or an issue happening during the wet dress rehearsal. All right, that's it for this week. A whole bunch happened, and there will be a whole bunch happening in the next week. So stay tuned. Thank you for all your support. We could not do any of this without you. And thank you for watching. And don't forget, be excellent to each other. I miss Dan.